So, uh, as Raphael said, I've been the director at the Home National Cemetery for 12 years. I did start working there after retiring from the Coast Guard in March of 1999. Uh, again, my service with VA and National Cemetery Administration as a uh, backhaul operator. Um, after five years, I became the cemetery foreman, and then a few years later, I became the cemetery director. So, that is not a normal path of progression, <laughs> uh, but uh, I managed to make it work for me. I was really telling you guys that we had to do that to try it, because it might not work for them. Um, but, I was fortunate, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity for that to be given. So, this is one of the ways that I have to give back. Uh, as a veteran, when I went to work at the cemetery, uh, I thought, man, what about this? Right? But after uh, a short time, uh, I was like, I don't know how I got lucky enough to fall into that position, but I couldn't see myself going anywhere else. So I decided to make the best thing to see just uh, how much I could accomplish while I was so, um, My expertise is with National Cemetery Administration. Uh, I will talk also a little bit about medical weight and the VA, uh, Washington State and your state VA cemetery and other rural cemeteries in the American cemeteries uh, because the VA does help uh, with that as well. So while I'm not an expert in those fields, I will try to help. Um, so my presentation is really geared around the home national cemetery. So please bear with me. That's why I say if we're talking about something and prompts a question in front of you, please feel free to raise your hand, ask a question, and, and we'll try to cover that. Okay. Um, Tohoma National Cemetery is in Kent, Washington, so all the way across the mountain. Um, it's a 158 acre cemetery. We average 12 burials a day, 3,300 burials a year. Uh, the busiest cemetery in the state, but we're not funeral. Okay? And, and a lot of funeral homes are attached to the cemetery. So we do not take care of bodies after death. We only take care of the remains of the burial. Okay? So uh, the cemetery is the same way at the medical age. Uh, the funeral home has to prepare the, the bodies and, and provide the outer containers, and then we do the uh, so we're strictly a center. Okay. Um, in 2016, VA and NCA, NCA being the National Cemetery Administration, did a study about the utilization rate in the national cemeteries. The overall utilization rate for the National Cemetery Administration, this is for veterans who have passed and that they can track back to using their benefit in the National Cemetery, was around 15%. Our area, the Pacific District area, was at 20%. And I'm proud to say, the only National Cemetery was one of the highest at 28%. But if you think about it, that's still a very, very tiny portion of people utilizing this method. Now, the Home National Cemetery is located in Kent, which is really kind of the, the central part of the Puget Sound area, <coughs> where the almost 400,000 veterans reside. And that's why we chose to put one in that location uh, when they built the cemetery, was because of the large veteran population. Medical Way is a VA state cemetery because there's not as many veterans living in that area. So if there were 366,000 veterans living in the Spokane area, within 75 miles of that, they probably would have built a, another VA cemetery. So let's just get to it. What's the difference between a state and a VA cemetery? I mean, right here, that right here. So the VA purchases the property, builds the cemetery, 
and the infrastructure, and then turns it over to the state, state EPA, right? And obviously, the state EPA has to hire their staff and run the center. Well, the state has to fund that, obviously, right? So the difference is, the main difference for me, eligibility is the same. There is a new law that was recently passed that hasn't uh, come into effect yet where National Guard and uh, Reservists may be eligible to be buried at the state cemetery. That is not the case at the national cemeteries, but uh, it hasn't been fully implemented yet. Okay, so that's a big change because uh, Guard and Reserves, if they didn't retire from the Reserves, were not eligible previously. Okay. But uh, the, the state VA has to find ways to pay for their staff and, and the center's operations, right? Well, the veteran burial is still free. Thousands and, and uh, eligible dependents, I, I, I want to say it's somewhere around $300 to do the internment there for them. Well, if you try to buy a burial plot in a civilian cemetery anywhere, Five hundred to three hundred dollars, yeah. So you can get a deal. Okay. But along with your grave site in a national cemetery or at the VA cemeteries, other than that, that small amount of money for a dependent or a spouse, everything else is paid for. Right? Your headstone is paid for. The setting of the headstone, the opening, closing of the grave, and the perpetual care of that grave site. Okay. You don't get that in every cemetery. So it, it is a financial benefit, right? It is the last benefit that the veteran ever, ever uses if they choose. Now we, the VA, will provide a head or marker even if the veteran is interred in a civilian cemetery. Okay? Not everybody knows that. So you want to make sure that if you know a veteran, uh, or a veteran's family member who's passed and they're going to be buried in a uh, cemetery. Now what we're going to do about parking and grave, let them know. Okay. Jump on the cemetery's website and take a look because we can provide that for the next one. Okay. Right. So Tahoma, as I said, opened in Romania. Uh, Tahoma opened in uh, October of 1993. We're getting ready to celebrate the 25th year of operation. Um, initially, the cemetery was designed for a lot of casting and dirt. Uh, but that all changed after the first 10 years or so of operation, and we were doing almost 70% of our permanent designations. So we had to uh, make some changes in how we expanded the cemetery from that time. So in 2012, between 2012 and 2014, we did a major expansion project, uh, which increased the number of grave sites by almost 30,000. But we followed the same scenario that we had for our determined ratio, which was about 70% of those graves were for cremations, and 30% of them were for caskets. So a lot of those casket space, a lot more cremation space. Well, what that does is it increases our ability to keep the cemetery open longer. Right? So by, by several years, I'm sure. Um, and we are right now in the planning stages for phase three. And there will be one other small expansion phase somewhere else down the line. But right now, once we complete phase three expansion, I believe we're looking at about 2050 before the cemetery is full. And then we'll, we'll, we'll start looking for, about the time we do the phase four expansion, we'll start looking for a, a new location for a new center. Um, we are landlocked. We have residential uh, homes all around us, with the exception of the home and middle school now. They will be middle school. Uh, and uh, it, it used to be the local high school. And I've talked to them about you know, maybe seeing some of their properties. They're not interested, so uh, we'll have to try to go to the new center. 
so they are they are able to find things that we can't. We don't have that. I'm sorry, one more thing. And so um, if a reservist wanted to know, they could do it now. Yes. Wait okay. past Monday now. Yeah. No. So we'll get into that later. Okay. Sorry. I think you have another time. I got one more. Yeah. 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 I'm in the midst of a well yeah. oh, okay. It was brought up that if a master of our reservist was deployed as part of a national emergency set to apply fires that might is that information also covered under the Depends. I think it's the, the, I think the orders Title Ten it's, or that, right? It's it's that. Yeah. It's Title Ten or that, the orders themselves proper. The hard part is tracking down how many times did you do something and like you got orders but you didn't nobody keeps their orders, you know. So that's the hard part is tracking that down. Getting the documentation is the hard part. Yeah, because I mean everything based on time frame. Right. right. Yeah. And one day, third day, yeah. whatever. I'm just looking for some place I can Yeah. Well that's why it's best if you have them contact us, give us the information. We can shoot everything for our own ability folks and try to get an answer. And We'll talk after this. There's a really good resource out there to to prep to get to them. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, a reserve component retiree is eligible, uh, just like any other veteran. They they did their 20 years in the reserves. They were never activated. They only did active duty for training. That's okay. You retired. You don't receive your benefits until you're an old man like me. But. You have that eligibility as well. Spouses, we get questions just about everywhere I go about is my wife eligible out of the National Cemetery? Yes. At the State Cemetery? Yes. Okay. Um, eligible dependents. So, what is an eligible dependent? It is a minor child or uh, a child in college up to age 23 that is still fully dependent upon their parents for their life. Okay, that's the key. Adult dependent child, a child who has a physical or mental disability and cannot take care of themselves. They had to be diagnosed prior to turning 21. Okay, if they ever took care of themselves, moved out of the house and were living on their own and had a job and were able to care for themselves, it probably is done. Okay? I know that's a harsh one, but that's the that's the way they determine whether or not they're okay. Yes? Never held a job, moved out of the house, yeah. homeless. If they left the house but they don't have another place to live. Again, okay, so you're getting into those gray areas where I'm not going to make that decision. I'm going to, I'm going to get all the information from the family and I'm going to forward that up to eligibility and let them say yes or no. Okay. okay. But I'm more than happy to do that for anybody that needs it. Okay. Uh, surviving spouse with a subsequent marriage. So a veteran passed and his spouse a few years later decides to remarry. Maybe her second husband passes before her, or maybe not. Maybe she just wants to be married with her husband. It's perfectly okay. She can be married to another person and pass away and still be interred with her first husband. Is there a limit on how many marriages? <laughs> guys, too. Okay. We, we have, this is, this is folklore, right? I have no physical proof. But you know, one of the former undersecretaries of Memorial Affairs uh, used to tell a story in his presentations about he was the director at Riverside National Cemetery in Southern California. And while he was there, he met a gentleman who had five wives very right there and was married again. Once they marry the veteran, they're eligible. They're not just one. Huh? Wow, I'm really like that. No, any spouse. He's an Egyptian god. Yeah. Well, I'm like, do wives want to be very next out of other wives? Who would have been the same grade? Our, our policy is one veteran, one grade. Okay? Well, obviously, you didn't get five castles in one grade, right? So, you got to do it. But, yeah, so, again, you know, all the ability is to turn it on who you are to have a castle. Okay? Uh, 
Are dependent spouses placed in the same grade with their veteran? Generally speaking, yes. And they share a headstone or a niche cover with the same information, right? So, uh, casket interments as a home national cemetery as upright headstones. The veteran's information goes on the front, spouse's information goes on the back. Doesn't matter who the veteran is, right? So, if the, the veteran is a, is a woman, hey, her information is going on the front and the spouse and the man going on the back. Okay? Um, much less room for information on cremated uh, remains, whether it's a Conbury wall or a, a flat marker for an in-ground interment, but because uh, both of those have to go on one side. What if the veteran is not interred at Tahoma, it's somewhere else, but the spouse wants to be interred there because of their family? Is that possible or does it have to be with the So it is possible, but uh, I'm sorry, walk up, walk up. Uh, it is possible. Uh, it's a, it, it would be a special case, and, and we have a, a way to make that work. We just have to do the Confirmation. Yes, it can. Uh, dependent minor children. Uh, we already kind of talked about that, so please. All right. Anybody familiar with the court chat? All right. So uh, dependent minor children are dependent minor children. We had a veteran die uh, in the early stages of Operation Iraqi Freedom. And he was not married. Um, his parents wanted to be buried. And they went and made the, the fight with Congress and all the politicians, and they created the Cory Act. So if a veteran passes and is unmarried, was never married, um, and no one else is going to utilize the grave space, and the mother and or father request to be buried with their veteran, son or daughter, we can't do that, whether they were veterans or not. Okay? Yes, can siblings do no. that if there's no parents? No. So what I can do is if I have a veteran that passes and is interred, and somewhere down the road in a year later or whatever, uh, their veteran sibling wants to be in truth with them. We can do that. But it can't be a non-veteran sibling. Okay? I'm sorry, is there any talk or anything going around um, to change that the, uh, the child has to predecease the parent? I looked into this because my mom wants to be buried with me, assuming I never get married. <laughs> no, but, um, but yeah, they said no, that I had to predecease her. Yeah, as far as I know, killed that's in combat. the case, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, the veteran had to have passed after October 7, 2021, because that was when the law came into effect. So we can't go back and do it after the fact. Um, why? I don't know, because we're afraid we have to do it. Uh, there has to be space in the gravesite. Um, and there's no surviving spouse or child that may be eligible for burial with them. Right? So we can't take a gravesite away from somebody else to give it to the veteran. Um, any questions about the eligibility part of that? Um, they have to be the biological or legally adopted parent, and then they have to have passed after the child. So, um, and then the eligibility part is, is really pretty easy as long as we have all the information. So, any questions about Corey Shea? Yes, sir. Is that mean it took them nine years to pass? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know the exact age of when it all started. Yes. Uh, another question about the no surviving spouse or child. Um, say that your veteran wasn't married but did have like a child, or a child or a relationship with somebody. Could they still be buried there, or do you have to be? The child can. The the uh, significant other. It has to be a legal marriage, at least still to this day. It, it could change in the future because we all know there's more and more people that uh, 
we live together and, and really for all intent and purposes our husband and wife and child uh, why should they not be eligible? I can't answer that question. That's a political thing. Um, yeah. So, so this is a this is the program that that Raphael was uh, referring to earlier, training, and this will help a lot of your uh, folks with questions that don't have an immediate need. Okay, so any veteran, friend of, family member of, neighbor of, acquaintance of, uh, ES, uh, veteran service officer of, whatever, can do a treaty eligibility request for a veteran. Okay, hmm. and you can do this online, or you can contact me, my, my staff will send you the paperwork and the information if you're not, uh, Computer tech. Okay, I didn't make this, just so y'all know. This is done by my, my folks at the cemetery. I'm not computer literate. I, I avoid them at all times. <laughs> my job doesn't allow me to avoid them totally, but um, I'm glad I got good people working for me to know how to do that. All right, so the uh, uh, email address is www.cem.va.gov. Okay? Find anything you want to know there. But who wants to go search it when you pick up the phone call? <laughs> so, uh, as you can see down here at the bottom of the page, it has, has a, a link to pre-need eligibility. So, uh, about eight years ago, nine years ago, uh, they came out with this great pamphlet, right? And it was called your, uh, I want to say it was called something about my fear legacy. And it's a whole pamphlet about all of the things that a person should do in preparation for their end of life. And it's a great pamphlet. I mean, it's got it. It even has the form, right? Problem is, they only printed them for one year. There aren't very many of them. Once it got attached to our website, they were like, oh, they can just do this online. No, we love this pamphlet. People love this pamphlet. Yeah. So that's the pamphlet is, is what I'm talking about, and yeah. I got a PDF of it. So yeah. I just, I just print. it's like 70 pages long. Yeah, if you but go to the link it's, here, it's, it's perfect. Yeah, it's, if you go to the link there, you can download that. Yes, and so if you go through the pre need eligibility and there's a question, will it automatically forward to the office it needs to? Okay, once, Sorry. You, fill, yeah. no, once you fill out the form, okay. You fax or mail it to our eligibility oh, folks. Okay. You'll get a letter, okay, back within 90 days saying they received your request. And somewhere in the future, you'll get a letter saying whether or not this person's eligible. That's why I say it's not a urgent time of need thing. It is a we got lots of time. Let's just figure out if we're eligible or not. Yeah. Did you say fax or see if we can't email? Um, I, you know what? <laughs> So what he does is accept the, the pre-registration. Yeah, it, it could. You could probably. Maybe, okay. Yeah. So what happened when we, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I know the, the medical side doesn't accept an email. You've got a fax. Yeah. So here's the, here's the issue, right? When, when we created this and we started talking about this in our outreach presentations initially, uh, there was a huge flood of emails. And that didn't work. We shut down our eligibility department's computers. And uh, so, yeah. So they may have taken away the email address. It'll tell you on the form how you need okay. to Okay. Yeah. All right. So for a, uh, for a veteran or anybody, um, I am an advocate of planning. Okay. We're all going to pass away. Sorry to tell you, none of us are living forever. Okay? I hate to tell you that I, I hope I'm not the first one. <laughs> uh, plan it out. Okay? Do the preparation. Let your kids know where your documents are. That's what this book and, and this, this PDF thing will tell you. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Where is it? Right? Have that conversation with whoever's going to take care of you after you pass away. I can have somebody buried within 48 hours. 
if they have their documentation to me as soon as possible, right? The, the, the internment process has to be able to take place quickly. We have religious factions that need these internments done within 48 hours. So our part is easy. As long as your part's ready, right? All I need or all we need is for you to fax the DD-214 to our scheduling office. Wait an hour and pick up the phone and call them. They will work with you to schedule that internment within two hours of receipt of that discharge document as long as they can tell that you're, that person's up. Okay? It's that simple. Yeah. Sorry, another question. Okay. Um, so, especially during COVID, we're having a lot of problems getting people's DD-214s, okay. and we were able to go online and um, do squares. Will the cemetery, will you guys accept a squares printout versus a DD-214? I'll accept anything. Okay, so it shows they're eligible. But I don't know if eligibility will. Okay, <laughs> So that's why, that's why I say that. If, okay. If you said whatever you have. Okay. They will do what they can do to determine eligibility, okay. and let them know, right? So I, we, we used to try to do that at the cemetery level, and there's just too much stuff there. So we, we actually have people that do that all day long, and they are way better than you are. So we just let them know. Okay, but, so, figure out the funeral home you want to use, figure out if you want to be uh, cremated or if you want to be in a casket, Maybe you want your, your ashes scattered at sea or on the top of the mountain or whatever. Uh, and you just want a memorial marker at a cemetery for your family to visit. Okay. What, whatever you want is what you should have. But if you don't plan it, you're going to get whatever the kids get. Mm -hmm. Or whoever. Right? <laughs> uh, I know my kids are going to just dump me in the toilet. <laughs> 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 Um, it's not what I asked for, so anyway, uh, you need to think about it, um, plan it out. If, if you're a veteran service officer or somebody that works with veterans, uh, talk to me about it. Most of them are pretty good about hearing good news. Um, or that. So be, be honest, you know. Uh, the, the hardest thing for a family to do when somebody passes away is have to plan all of this stuff and find it and figure it all out. So if you at least get your DH214 and stuff someplace where they can grab it and send it to us so we can make all the determination and help schedule this stuff, it'll make your life so much easier. Okay? That's my pitch for that. Next slide. Um, okay, the form is 21B5330. Um, and it tells us right here, you can fax it to the scheduling office or you can mail it to St. Louis. Uh, now, online, again, that's our, our email. So I think you can find the form and all the information there, but I'm not sure that there's an email address for the same. Okay? Next slide. All right. So I'm just going to kind of cover some of the things we already went over to make sure I didn't miss anything. So once you receive your pre-need eligibility certificate, give a copy of, uh, of that to your executive uh, Give a copy to the funeral home you've chosen. This is assuming you've made all these arrangements now. Uh, and ensure a copy of your DDT-14 is available, available for your family uh, and, and a request for military honors if you want those. Now, Let's just talk about what are military honors? What are your preconceived ideas of military honors? So military honors used to be the grandiose, you know, we'll carry the casket in, we'll place it, we'll fold the flag, we'll do a rifle salute, we'll play taps. Okay. Nowadays you get two people from the military, only one of which has to be from the current service. They'll fold and present the flag. Mm -hmm. All right. Not quite what it used And that's because of the size of, of our military branches now. They've downsized, they're modernized, they don't need as many people. Somebody would make sure people running around to do these things. Uh, luckily for me, at Tacoma National Center, I have an outstanding veteran service organization volunteer group. Right? I currently have 
16 honor guards that are from the Department of Veterans Affairs, or the Disabled Veterans of America, American Legion, VFWs, uh, that rotate and do these military officers. All right, after duty comes in, they fold and protect the flag, and my volunteers will provide a rifle salute and pass. Okay? Folks are getting old, and they ain't gonna be around for them. So, I don't know what's gonna happen as they're going to leave back. Uh, but we will continue to do that as often as we can for a conference. Yes. I'm sorry, real quick again. Um, first and foremost, I was a reservist for a long time and I did active duty, but um, if you ever have the chance or you know people who have the chance to go present a flag, please do it. Please, I did a lot, and it really meant a lot to me. I only cried once, which was good, but um, I, just, I just highly, yeah, tell everybody it's really a moving experience. Anyway, second thing. Um, so, I, and this is just me just thinking this, because um, I never asked you about it before, but down at Willamette National, I'm from Vancouver, but they have the National Guard there doing it. Uh, the 21 gun salute. They have a unit assigned to them. Every burial I've done, they've been there. I don't know if it has to be requested, and they requested us to do that too. But the other, I guess, my question is, the other cemeteries don't have that. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Good to yeah. So, uh, funny you say that because the director at Willamette National Cemetery mm -hmm. used to work for me, mm -hmm. and uh, I kicked him out of the nest. And, and maybe they've stopped it by now. It's been a while since I've been to a cemetery, but they yeah. were doing it every, so, every one. My former boss, uh, when he retired, moved to Vancouver. He worked for 30 years at Willamette before he came well, to Willamette. Nice. Uh, anyway, he passed away, and I had to take my honor guard down to Willamette really? to make sure that he had military on. The other two people there to form and present the flag, but yeah. Wow, okay. So I'm not sure. What's, what's going on with it? Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the National Cemetery Scheduling Office. So they are open seven days a week, except for some holidays. Um, they take care of our eligibility. They're open central time from 7 to 6.30. We try to make sure that we're available to the funeral homes and, and families as many hours a day as we can. Uh, they are closed Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's Day. They do have an email address, the fax number. So they prefer that you send them the fax, wait 30 minutes, I say 60, uh, and then call the other number and they can give you a case number, establish your case, schedule your date and time of service, all of that, okay? If you don't know all of those things, that's okay. They'll still establish the case, tell you everything is good to go. They'll send the case to the cemetery. We'll reach out to the family, and we'll schedule it. Okay? You need to fax the eligibility certificate. That level is going to for me. So if you don't have a premium eligibility certificate, all you have for a DD-214 or, or a honorable discharge document or whatever you have, your, your swears, whatever that is, send it. Seriously, send it. Because they have access to a lot of stuff that I don't have access to. And we will find out if they're over here. Okay, yes, ma'am. Um, I work with a lot of low-income people who um, may have some executive functioning issues. If they, if their loved one, their spouse, yeah. their parent passed away at the death office already, can they still apply? You know, they don't have it. Can they still apply for us? Okay. Yes. But I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you the best thing for you to do in those situations, in your situation is to tell, talk to them about that. And if they have a veteran family member, whether it's a parent or whatever, uh, that is home. And, and nobody knows if or where any of this documentation might be. You go online and make a request to the National Records Center for their military documentation. Hang on to it yourself. Right? You don't want to give it back to them and you have a cost. So hang on to it for yourself. Hopefully you're able to stay in contact with them enough to know if and when they pass, and you can take care of that for them, okay? But do that early. Don't wait until they pass away, because it can take six months to, to get that request filled, okay? 
Yes, we mentioned as well. I, I know that at least at the VA hospital, if you're able to get that D214 early, you can take it to your records office right. and you can scan it with CDRS. And that's a, an easy way for right. staff at the hospital to retrieve it for you. The other thing is, if it's a veteran, if they have applied for VA benefits, whether they're medical, monetary, whatever, um, they'll be in the system and, and we can use that as a determination of eligibility as well. Okay? But the more information you have, the easier it is for us to do what we need. Okay? All right, next slide, please. So other resources that are available on our website. Um, so if you are a VSO a veteran service officer or just a family member, whatever. Um, there's a, a link to assisting the family through this, right? So that's, we, we put that on there really for funeral home directors so that they would be able to uh, help veteran families. So, but that doesn't mean anybody else can't jump in there and look at it and see if you've got that information, right? So we, we have a whole section on burial, the burial flag, military funeral honors, and the headstones, graves, and the body, grave markers, and the body. So burial flags. You should, uh, when you have the death certificate, be able to go to your post office and get issued a flag, all right? If for some reason you can't get a flag from the post office, and you happen to be around Coma National Cemetery, um, I will provide a flag. We, we have flags, we will issue you a flag in California that we fill out, they have to the flag, okay? So what did you, you say you need to take? Sorry? I'm sorry, what did you say you need to take with you to the post office? The death certificate. Death, okay. Well, and, and probably the so that they can verify yeah. the work okay. And there is, a, there is a, a form. I don't know the form number, but there okay. is a form that you have to take. Yeah, but you can fill that out while you're there. It's not, it's not a real big yeah. form. They should have pretty more. Yeah. On hand? Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Yeah, I mean, we do that at the cemetery. If somebody needs to buy it, we have them to form out. It's like a five-minute deal. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I'll issue the, the flag. Um, Military funeral orders, we kind of talked about that. So at the National Cemetery, I don't know that the state cemetery is exactly the same, but at Tacoma, we have three funeral shelters. Uh, we have a service every 30 minutes. So it's not a long service. It's not intended to be. It's all day funeral service. We are committing the remains of the veteran or family member to the grave. What it does is it offers the family an opportunity to have military honors with a white person. You're not going to do that at a funeral, okay? You're inside a building, they're not going to let you fire a rifle. <laughs> right? So this is in an outdoor setting, right? And it, it gives uh, my volunteers and, and the uh, military a place to do that, okay? Um, not all cemeteries have that, some do. Um, so, you know, wherever you live, you want to check with where you're going to be in and all that stuff. But that's, it can be done, right? Getting a full detail from the military these days is almost impossible. Um, even for high ranking officers, which used to be a given, and even senior enlisted used to be just automatic. Um, nowadays, they, they just can't support that. Um, at Tacoma, the uh, National Guard from Camp Murray supports our cemetery a lot. They do all, basically all of the Army services, unless it's the KIA, Killed Army Active Duty. Um, but even they have been cut to the point where they're only sending a three minute team. So they used to send six or seven people. Um, so they're hoping to get some additional funding so they can pick up their group uh, a little more again, but we don't know when they're going to um, headstones, grave markers, the dying. At the National Cemetery or the State Cemetery, we're going to work with the family, we're going to make that happen for them. But what if they choose to be buried in a local cemetery? There is a form for that. No, of course there's <laughs> uh, And you just fill the form out, you send it to our memorial program services folks, and they will fill that order. It's going to take a while. Okay? We have a limited number of people that receive those and, and do that. It won't take forever. Um, 
I can have a, a headstone set at the Home National Cemetery between 60 and 90 days, sometime soon. Um, it'll probably be three to six months at a uh, local cemetery. Okay. Next slide, please. On our website, there is a nationwide gravesite locator. If you want to know if a veteran is interred in any national cemetery, you can use this to make that certain. Okay? If they're interred in a national cemetery somewhere, it'll tell you. Now, I caution you, Robert Smith is going to be in a lot of cemeteries. And in some cemeteries, Robert Smith's going to be there multiple times. <laughs> so, you, the more information you can put in, if you have a very common name, the better off you are. Okay? Like if you know that they're buried at Tahoma or Fort Snelling in Minnesota, or if you think that's where they are, search through individual cemetery first. Okay? That, that way you'll narrow your search and you'll have less people to try to fill Okay, but it's a great resource for uh, people who have a lot of veterans in their family and, and are curious if their loved ones are in a national cemetery. Okay? So I talked a little bit about our committal service at Tahoma. Um, this is kind of the way it works for us. So uh, we have the next of kin uh, sitting at a bench in, in front there. There are other benches for other family members. They look very comfy, right? <laughs> so we used to use folding chairs. And then they just fall apart. So anyway, we got these. Um, people don't want to sit on those for a long, long time, which is okay, because we're only giving them a 20, 25 minute service anyway. So. But I make fun of it because it was such a big deal for us to get back done. <laughs> uh, so, military arms. At Tahoma, more often than not, we can't provide that, okay? It may not be the active duty military or the reserves doing it. My, my volunteers will do most of them, but we, we can do it most of the time. We have a veteran service organization chaplain along with our military honors volunteer groups. So, if you need a chaplain, provide it, okay? Uh, if the family has their own third, that's okay, we just need to know. Okay, that way our honor guard can change their normal service around to accommodate that. Mm -hmm. Their service is for the veteran and the family. Uh, so when we have special requests, we need to know those so that we can let them know so they can modify their service a little bit to allow time for family members or, or whatever with them. Basically what we want is we want the service to be what the family wants, okay? So if a family wants the clergy, and, but they don't have one, but they don't want the rifle salute and all that other stuff, that's okay. We'll just have the armor guard that, uh, chaplain do the first one, so whatever it is they need, okay? Uh, one of my staff, one of my uh, cemetery representatives is going to be out the shelter. They're going to run the service. Uh, they will retire the urn and or casket at the end of the service. And the foreign family can stick around for a while and, and talk or whatever they need to do. We will have another service starting there in about a half hour, so we can't let them stay forever, but they can hang out a little while. Um, and then any part of the service can be optional, like I said. We just need to know that ahead of time so that we can prepare the honor guard so they can change their script up a little bit. So, okay. I had an incident with this at one of, one of my ceremonies. Um, can there be more than one flag presented to a family member at the service? No. Okay. It, well, I'll, let me, uh, yes. But well, I thought the family we, has to ask for it. Yes. Okay. Provide them the flag. Okay. Yeah. 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 Now, am I going to argue with somebody over that? No. Okay. I'm, I, I can't. I'm not supposed to. So there yeah. you go. I had a guy get up, throw a chair, you know. Yeah, no. yeah it no, was. I'm no, like, no, what no, is going no. on? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah right. you know. No, no. Yeah, so. Yeah. And I thought afterwards, I'm like, why can't they just give him a blank? Yeah, so because the family needs to do it. Okay. Yeah, it, it's kind of like the great site. One death and one flag, one death and one grave. Uh, but we all do what we got to do, right? So. Yeah. 
I'm not going to say I would do it, and I'm not going to say I wouldn't do it. Uh, what does the DOD provide? Kind of talked about this. Two, two members, only one has to be from the Veterans uh, Branch of Service. Army and Air Force normally won't provide a rifle team. This is obviously old. Um, but it's, all the DOD is contingent upon whether they are close. It's on the family member, family, to contact the active duty branch and talk to them about what they can and cannot provide. And then they can let us know and we, we will help supplement how we do. Yeah, so that's not important. The, that, that's, the Air Force, um, most branches of the service right now, they're, they're not going to handle the remains as fall barriers because there aren't enough people to do it themselves. So they don't want to do it at all. Okay, which is fine. We're, we got it covered. It, it gets done well. Next slide. Um, VSO provides a non-denominational chaplain um, and will provide a rifle team for the veteran service. Um, now everybody wants to call this a 21 gun salute, which when you have seven riflemen, they did. If you have three riflemen, it's a three gun ball. Okay. Still three rounds, still three things, just not by seven people and not 21. Okay, it, that's that's the important part. Okay, is it's, it really is about the three three rounds, the three balls. Whether it's three people or seven, really doesn't matter. That got um, publicized in, in by uh, like presidential burials and stuff. They call it a 21 gun salute. It's never been a 21 gun salute. It's been seven people firing three rounds, 21 rounds. Okay. History. Uh, the VSO provides viewer, and if they don't have a viewer with them, we have a taps player, which is a recording, and, and taps will be played one way or another. That's the one. Do you have the one where the recorders and the bugle? Yeah, the, we don't have one. I did the, that honor guard, uh, the volunteer honor guard does. Uh, yeah, that was yeah. crazy. And three of those. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I've had to do it, and I was like, really? You want me to stand here like yeah. this? Like, yeah. It's better than not doing it. It is. It is. So, it is. Um, and right. our pitch if you're interested in volunteering at the Home National Cemetery, please let us know. Next slide. So, uh, we do have uh, every month veterans that are interred at the cemetery um, without military arms. Okay, uh, family members can't get together and have a service. Um, they could be indigent, homeless, um, native family just didn't like them. Uh, whatever the case may be, we track those. And then on the second Saturday of every month, with the exception of November, because that's too close to Veterans Day, uh, we hold a service, and we do the same exact service that we do for any other veteran at the communal shelter. But in this case, because there's multiple, we read a list of the names, and we, we don the bell for each name. Okay? So that is how we ensure Every veteran at the Home National Cemetery has received military arms. We send a letter out to the next of kin for each of those veterans so they can attend if they choose to. So we're trying to get the family to come if they can or want to, but we also want them to know that military honors will provide for the family. Okay, so that's very important to me, very important to my volunteers and my staff. And so we've been doing that for a long, long time. And we even went back and did all of the direct to determine uh, veterans that were very before we started with the program. So, uh, next slide. Presidential Memorial Certificates. Um, the next weekend can choose to receive a Presidential Memorial Certificate at the service. It is signed, signed by the current city president, so if you don't like them, <laughs> uh, they're presented at the committal service uh, if you want additional requests. Now, we'll give the family as many of these as they want. So if there's like six kids and they all want their own, okay. Uh, but 
what we do is we give you the forms, have you sent them in, and they'll send them out. Right? We're only going to provide one at the cemetery, uh, but additional ones are available, no problem. Um, we've actually had, I, I know I said that kind of, that is signed by the city president. We actually have people coming down. So, oh, who signed is that? Oh, no, I don't want <laughs> Really? Yeah. Can that be retroactive? Like, so like. Yeah, it does not matter. If, you're, if you have a great grandfather that passed away in 2021 and you want to release from them and you know where they're at, yeah. Yeah. Good. Dependent services are self led and. and uh, but we hold it to the same timeline, okay? Um, the family must provide their own clergy or speak for themselves. Um, the staff will be present uh, to bring the family in, park the cars, get them all set up. Um, we do often, actually, uh, schedule what we call a double return, uh, double service. So the husband and spouse are both deceased and they're both going to be in the cemetery. Uh, we will schedule one followed by the other or we can do them both at the same time as the family's choice. Okay. Um, and then of course, you just need to know that ahead of time. Yeah. I don't mean to go back okay. with, the, with the presidential cert. Yes. We live out in the middle of the boonies, so a lot of people are going to choose local cemeteries and stuff like that. How do we go about that process? Getting this? The, the presidential thing, yeah. The, the memorial certificate? Yeah. Yeah, so it's on the website. Okay, yeah. perfect. The form to, to apply for that is on the website, and you can mail it in, and, and you'll receive those. Yes, ma'am. I just Thank want you. to say that you do also have to make sure that you understand it's going to be signed by the sitting president yes. at the time of application. Um, some people have a problem with her. Yeah. Okay, and I'm sorry, but I know a, a friend told me I had to ask this. So, um, her and her husband are veterans. What do they do in that case? Like, are they both deceased? Do they both have their own separate they plots? Can. Or, or they, they, they can, can be buried together. Okay, and they can decide who sits on top of it. I thought the veteran was always on the top of the grave. No. No? Is that a folklore? It's, yes. Okay. Who predeceases who? Okay. Okay. The easiest way to do it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So we, we have a, a grave, and, and the first person goes in at the, the death of the first grave, and then the second person. So. Okay. Or they can have their own separate ones. Yeah. <laughs> now, if they both decide to have their own separate ones, yes. can they can the cemetery accommodate them being in this, you know, next to each other? Yes. Okay. That is the only time we will reserve a grave site. Okay. At Good to the know. National Cemetery is if both uh, spouses are veterans and they request it at the time of the first. Okay. So, quick question. Um, just because people don't really know this, say somebody, ha say they had a veteran family member pass and um, they couldn't afford to bury the ashes and they've held on to them for some time. Yep. Is it the same process yep. as far as just application and all? Yep. Does it matter how long ago or whatever, no. as long as they're You're, you're complaining about cremated remains is, they don't have a shelf life. Right, right. Yeah, you can hang on to them for as long as you want. And, and uh, yeah, it's the same exact process. Okay. You have the D214, you've decided you want to do the internment, you send it to the scheduling office, call an hour later, They'll set it all up, easy, just like any other. So. Another question, I'm okay. sorry to go back, okay. but the headstones, does the VA um, just provide the headstone at, at a um, uh, yes. different center? Yes, right? is on the hook for this place. Okay, yeah. Yep. Yes, ma'am? Uh, what if the remains are somewhere else? Does the VA help get those to your cemetery? No. no. Okay. So if you want to relocate remains from uh, another cemetery, then the family has to work with that cemetery to do the tournament and have them sent to us and go through the process of eligibility and everything. What I was thinking was like if someone had ashes uh -huh. and had them for years and they're in a different state or something. But that, that the dude, dudes, is that the family's responsibility to get those ashes to the cemetery? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. But they, I mean, uh, so cremated remains can be made through the UPS, through the postal service. Wow. You just let them know. They have a, a special. Uh, but if they fly, you have yeah. to have you have yeah. to have 
um, special documentation and yeah. validation yeah. and trial yeah. care by right. emailed. Absolutely. Yes, sir. In, in that same note, we had a veteran pass away in Arizona, mm -hmm. and we had to make arrangements to get the body yeah. on an airplane. Yeah. This yeah. Um, yeah, that's so that's a lot. But it all happens so fast. Right. You don't have time to email document right. the facts. Yeah. You just well, yeah. Does, does there any, any benefit part of, for that? To, to transfer? No. 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 Nothing that I know of anyway. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yes, Throw in real quick. We have our Clark County Veteran Assistance Center, and I think almost all counties have their Veteran Assistance Center. Anyway, we help pay for that. Really? Out of, out of, out of our, it depends how your, how your, you know, your policies are written, but our Veteran Assistance Center can help pay for that. Can we do it? And there's a VA benefit for transportation. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, good to know. We need to ask for that. All right. Any other questions about dependent services? All right. Thanks, sir. So why do you want to use the National Cemetery? And I'm not going to go through all this. I'll just like you to kind of take a look at that and decide for yourself if it's worth the money. Yeah. I can't be buried in mausoleum. You don't have. Come on. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> do you need a burial vault? I'm sorry. Do you, do you need a burial vault if they're burying your ashes? No. No. Okay. Yeah. And we provide those for the caskets, but not for cremation. Okay, questions? Yes, sir. All right, then. So we talked about uprights. Uh -huh. there's, there's flat markers. Um, we have a veteran cemetery, and they only allow the flat markers. Okay. That's what I meant. Yep. They, they feel it, it disturbs them. Yep. You can thank the uh, Undersecretary for Memorial Affairs for whatever cemetery that is. So whoever the Undersecretary for Memorial Affairs is at the time the cemetery is open for use, determines the type of headstones and or markers that will be used at that scene. So if you have an uh, undersecretary who likes upright markers, then everything's going to be upright markers. If you have an undersecretary who likes all flat markers, like at the moment, you're going to have all flat markers. Okay. Much easier to mow. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, yeah. Uh, but but that's, that's how it happens, okay? So, so when the cemetery is open, they determine the type of markers that they're going to have in the cemetery, and then everybody from that point forward uses that type of marker. So the question that I would have on it is that the family ordered it upright yeah. but wasn't aware of the standards okay. of that. Yeah. Is there an exchange policy for that or now they have an upright? Yeah. And um, we just lay it down in the ground and go? So did that actually happen? Yeah. No. I have okay. A, so, worst case scenario, I'm preparing myself. So uh, the, the paperwork itself, they have to take it to, to, the, the, to the, the cemetery that they want. Yeah want it to be at and the cemetery has to sign off on it so hopefully they would provide that information then and say like hey this is what we do or don't do right hopefully i mean <laughs> so it could happen and, and to the best of my knowledge no they can't send it back and get a replacement so and that's actually like i didn't know that so that's something i'll arm people with now like hey make yeah, sure, make sure yeah. you get that asked because I didn't know I didn't know that was a thing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it was going to be along the lines of what he just said, okay. basically. But it, when you're filling out the the memorial marker one, there is a specific section on the bottom. Yeah. And I had to do this just two weeks ago. I sent the surviving spouse to the cemetery because they have to sign off. All she wanted was the medallion. Right. Even with just the medallion, it has to follow whatever those cemeteries' rules are. And that's part of the application that gets sent before a marker even gets made. Um, and that's in a, in a private cemetery. I did also kind of have a question. Can you speak to the application process for those burial reimbursements in how the VA makes the decision what they will and want not will and will not pay for, and whether or not if you incur the transportation expenses at the time of burial in a Tonoma National Cemetery, if the VA will reimburse that on the property. 
Uh, I will do my best. Okay. But I, I do not work for VBA, and so I don't know all of the benefits associated with uh, that. Um, Steve might be able to help us out a little bit there too. Um, so before before I do that, uh, medallions. What's a medallion? Um, I slide. I don't, I'm sure this is not there. So the medallion is a small uh, medallion that can be attached to a civilian headstone and it indicates the branch of service that the veteran was in. Okay, so it'll say veteran, US Army, Air Force, whatever. Um, but you have to, there's a, a specific way that it is attached to that uh, headstone. Um, so you have to make sure that the, the cemetery is okay with you um, altering that, and you may have to pay somebody to do it and all that. But uh, the medallion itself is, is free of charge. So if you don't, if you didn't receive a, a government headstone or marker, the medallion can be uh, provided in its place. Okay. Um, so if a if a person is uh, a disabled veteran drawing VA VA benefits or VA benefits. Um, then I know that the uh, Benefits of Administration role, role has some monetary uh, benefits that they can provide. But we're, so the cemetery is really not in that. We, we don't have the forms or, or even know the forms. Yeah. So Steve, if you have a second, if you want to. Yeah, it, it's, it has been a while for, for me yeah. since I was doing uh, burial benefits. Um, however, like, like like Tom said, uh, there there is some eligibility. I, I actually believe it's a 21P 530 form. Yeah. yeah that, that. You could fill that out and send it in. I'm just wondering if anybody knows or has clarification on how the VA makes those decisions. I know there's a difference between service-connected debt and non-service-connected debt. Yeah. But I remember reading even on the 530 that it would be no less than $300 or something along those lines. There's like a basic benefit. But I've heard of people applying for this burial benefit and getting nothing, even for a non-service connected debt. And yeah. so I'm just wondering if somebody can kind of break that down and give me a schoolhouse rock version of it so that I can, I can follow along and pass along to the people I'm working with. Yeah, yeah there, there's, there's, a, there's a plot benefit and the internment benefit, and this is from a while back. There's it's 300 and 300. It might have actually been... Um, uh, cost of living polarized, so it might be more than that now. And I'm sorry, I'm just it's that's, that's it's been a while. And that's that's for non-service connected debt. The service connected debt, um, really, uh, in many many times we have that automated as well for veterans who are 100% service connected at the time of death. And if we have if we know of a spouse that was already on the award, we get notified of the death, and we can start up what's what's called DIC benefits and, and pay out the service connected uh, debt. We get a 21 P 530 at the same time. Yeah. And, and and there's also the transportation if if the interment is at the the national cemetery. So the. What you have is what looks like a standardized benefit, which was like 300 or, yeah. and then 300, but it ends up being the, those crooked numbers yeah. uh, uh, as well. Can, can an organization apply for that also with the 21P? Yeah, I, I believe so. I, I know I work with, um, you said his name earlier, for, from Spokane. Oh, Rudy. Uh, Rudy. Yeah. I know we work with Rudy a lot, and, and we okay. do plot after plot after plot for him. And for him. So okay. organizations do work with us. Okay. And if you want to meet me afterwards, I can give you my card, and I can give you some better uh, answers. So you said the dependent gets notified automatically, or it's as long as they're if they're already accepted. Yeah. That's that, something that I wonder if my office is like. Because that's one of the things that we do with the legacy planning is like this is for your dependent as well so to set them up so they don't have to deal with this moving forward. So that just harms me with information saying like, hey, this will automatically start moving as long as we do this paperwork and fill this out. Yeah, if we can get that. Sometimes that's the first notification we get is the 21P530 right. filled out. And, you know perfect case scenario but it, it, it does happen very frequently when we do know the spouse we do know the veterans percentage we've got the the death certificate all that stuff and I've, I've seen it so like we've automated it and sometimes I've, I've seen widows come into my office that want to apply for, for benefits 
I like yeah, I can help you. And then I look at my computer. Well, you're already getting it. And yeah. she said, uh, yeah, well, that's my that's my husband's company. You know, but that's actually the DIC. So right. okay, that's yeah. good to know. Yeah. yeah. And then for us in our county, we use our veterans advisory for like a relief fund for for stuff that kind of goes above and beyond. That's yeah. And we're working on that. And every county is a federal relief fund when it comes yeah. to burial services. Are going to be different? And for yeah. example, yeah. and I just could speak to this, but only because I know. You know, some of them are. You know, it's a set amount, two hundred fifty dollars, regardless. Right. Now I can say that Grant County, it's a, a it's. <laughs> It's staggering how much they give. Where a county next door is only going to give like two fifty. So, I mean, they have discretion. So, and the only way that those are going to change for kind of to meet the kind of that supplemental part is actually better an advisory board to come in and say like this is important for these families that can't get them there. You know, yeah. That's what we did. I'm on the board, and we voted, and we upped the amount that they could use. So. So, but I know, yeah, all the counties are different. I think it's important that you guys, if you have that ability to work with that veteran advisory board to make sure that but you're meeting those At things. the end of the day, it's up to the commissioners, so be their friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Be nice to the, count, yeah, to the council. All right, next slide. Can I say something real quick? So I think the takeaway from this question is, was the veteran service connected? Died as a consequence of that service connected disability and the amount of money is the maximum that is, that is allowed, right? So depending with the expenses, but there is a transportation, et cetera, et cetera. If that veteran was not service connected, the amount is smaller and is limited to specific things like, you know, uh, we're talking about cremation. So anyway, the takeaway is, number one, was the veteran service connected? And there's all this stuff open stuff for him or her. And the last thing I want to say is there's a thing that the VA puts out, the federal VA puts out, that is awesome. It's called fact sheets. Go in there and print those fact sheets. They are simple, straightforward, and it's that step by step by step by step. And is that a VA duck Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, we'll go through this pretty quickly because this is really mostly about coma and not necessarily everywhere that you go. Our burial options uh, for casket interment are uh, pre-placed cribs. So pre-placed crib really just means that we uh, open up a big area, we put a, a small drain, drain field underneath it, we put pre-placed concrete miners in that section, and then we cover the background. So rather than at the time of interment, digging a seven foot grave and putting a concrete liner in and back throwing it and going back and doing that process a second time later, we just did it all the, to start. Okay. Uh, so when we enter the second person or his house, the entire headstone is replaced. So uh, the family has the opportunity to adjust the terms of endearment and that kind of stuff at that time. Uh, okay, next slide. Uh, these are column burial walls. These are for cremations. They're uh, uh, 10 inches wide and 13 inches high or something like that. Uh, so we always ask the family, what size are you bringing? Because <laughs> yeah. not every urn is going to fit in there. All right, next. And this is uh, an example of a in ground cremation section. So these are three by three sites. The headstone sits at the top of the grave. Um, and we can we can actually, depending again on the size of the urn, we can get three or four urns in there if we need to, but generally we only have to do a couple. So uh, next slide. And this is our, our new memorial wall. Uh, nice. Part of phase two expansion. These look a lot like the uh, columnary walls, but the uh, cover is smaller, and it's it's really they're pretty cool looking. But um, there's no place to put remains or anything. It's just a, a marble uh, plate with the remain and memorializes the dead. This is uh, a really cool thing that nobody ever uses. It's called an ossuary. Um, what it is is a big vault under this fancy cap, and uh, should somebody 
uh, not really know what they want to do with the remains of the veteran. Uh, they can place them in this ossuary. They will be coping. It's like a scattering garden, but it's contained. Um, so they, they would be placed in there, and then they would have a marker on the memorial wall next to it. Is this in Tahama? It is. And it just hasn't been used? Nobody has chosen to use it. We've, we've had, uh, I don't know, several calls from, from people asking about it, but nobody's ever followed through with using it. And yeah, the state one, has, yeah, they have a scatter ground. Everybody has a scatter ground. So you dump your ashes in there and they just land on top of somebody else's ashes down yep. below? Yeah, it's, it's like I said, it's like a scatter like garden. So you walk out to the end of a, a platform and you throw the ashes in here and they go with the ashes. At civilian cemeteries, it's a lot cheaper to use something like that. That's a big reason they're there for for that purpose. In civilian, well, and, but. and so when we first had this uh, installed, I was visited by a uh, Joint Veterans Advisory Committee to the President, and uh, they saw this, and one of the members was from Guam. Huh? And she was unbelievably excited about this option. Is that that's yeah, a tradition? We can't build more room on our island. Right? Right. We're running out of space for doing burials. Oh, nice. So she was like, yeah, I'm taking this back to Guam with me. And I don't know how that ever turned out, but she was really excited. So uh, next time. So we do do uh, some annual or yearly ceremonies. Um, we do a uh, anniversary of the uh, Vietnam War commemoration. Um, that's in March. Uh, we honor and pay tribute to Vietnam veterans and their families. Um, well, the last couple of years hasn't been great with COVID, so you know, it was the videotape and put it on Facebook kind of thing, and it wasn't the same, but we also are a uh, Vietnam War commemoration partner. So when we are able to hold the ceremony, and there are veterans who haven't received their long home payment and all that, we make a big deal out of it. Nice. Uh, next, Memorial Day, we have a ceremony every day or every year on Memorial Day at 1 o'clock at our assembly area, Michael uh, Warner. The cemetery is decorated in individual gravesite flags and our avenue flags as well. Veterans Day is held in November on Veterans Day. At 11, 11, 11, right? 11, 11, 11, 8, 11 a.m. Mm -hmm. Get this simple. <laughs> Same thing. They do the, the, basically, the cemetery is decorated out just like it is on, on the board. Next slide. Greece across America has become a huge, huge thing. Uh, we we uh, received donated Greece and uh, Normally, the third Saturday, every once in a while, they spring it to uh, spring it on the second Saturday. But uh, we have a, again, we have a ceremony that uh, the Civil Air Patrol pretty much uh, runs. And uh, we will uh, have the flags you know, replaced on, on right after this. Evening. So it's done pretty early in the morning. Um, but, uh, and it's really cold in that day. Hey, it's fun. Next example. All right. So we always make a, a pitch for our volunteers, and I know being in Houston, Washington, that's probably you know, <laughs> not the best thing, but uh, our volunteers are amazing. Our public information center, which is the first building, they take all the funeral courthouses come in, they greet them, they get them lined up, they're a place to use the restroom before they go to their service. Uh, they help give them information about what's about to happen, all of that. Uh, that is fully and totally manned by volunteers right now. It's getting close to the point where we're going to start supplementing it with uh, staff. Hopefully we don't get there. Uh, same with our honor guards. Uh, they, they always need people too, so if you know people in that area that need something to do, let us know. Um, additional questions? Sir? So you got that to hold on. Yep. Yeah, medicals or whatever. Yeah, medical aid. Yeah. Pardon my French. Why the fuck isn't there one now in the middle oh. of the state? So, Why isn't there one in the middle of the state? So I do have that, actually. I think I can answer that. Since I don't do burial services, the only reason because we need to get the information. So when they were looking for land, I mean, finding land on the west side, obviously, really difficult, um, very expensive. So 
they actually were. It was gifted, the land and medical aid. But they're actually actively looking for other properties to have other state cemeteries. So, like, because they see the dis disproportionate, like, it's not even. You know what I mean? So they recognize that. But the problem is, is, you know, if you think about it, I mean, we have to find ways to make that happen. So, I mean, they were gifted or granted that land, and then um, they've had other, you know, offers. But it's, it has to be advantageous because you can't be just like you get it, and you can't be landlords kind of thing. So, well, they are actively looking. So, if anybody knows that mm -hmm. you said that, you know, please get in contact with the State Department, you know, watch the State Department of Veterans Affairs because they'll investigate. You know, they'll like actively, um, really, you know, really figure it out. By the number of veterans in the area as well. I've asked family after family after family that has been down on the money. Would you like your loved one to be buried in a national cemetery? Where's it at? I said, well, it's over on the coast, we're over on the border. No. Then we can't visit him. Right. Right. You know, it's, it's a matter of. I, I, I feel your pain, I do. But, but it's the number of veterans in an area that dictate whether or not we can do that. And uh, very good explanation. Um, I mean, I don't have all the answers. I'm yeah. I, was, I got to play yeah, I, I do know. I do know this. I do know Alfie, like you said, is actively searching for ways to provide additional burial benefits for veterans in small communities and rural communities, specific yeah. So again. If the state wants your land to build an interstate, they'll put him in the domain on it. We want to build a cemetery, eminent domain, and that plot of land. Nobody's got it's got a ton of rocks on it. Get a bulldozer, move them rocks out. We're gonna put a cemetery right there and make use of it because all it's doing is sit there. Piece of cake. You know what I mean? But then again. So if anybody knows, I have this st our state um, handouts for DDA. It also has all the information. It tells you where to get the the pre registration app. Um, if you need more, I can get them. Uh, Rudy was actually watching, so you know. If you have um, questions, I can at least uh, there. Quick question. Well, you hand that out. Um, so we are like everybody like had mentioned about. WDBA trying to figure out a section in, in central Washington. Actually, Wenatchee is one of the locations that we are looking at. But usually, let me give you an example, the best example I can give you about how this happens. Medical Lake was created because of this problem. And the land is actually federal land that was given to us to maintain. But before that can happen, there's this thing that's called environmental impact statement. Cemeteries, you just don't put them anywhere. And that's one of the things that have slowed things down. I also have to add that the tribes actually also are seeking areas where they can uh, put on cemeteries. So it is not, we are considering, seriously considering. I've been working with OCDBA for 10 years and since day one. Going to happen, then it gets shut down. So what I'm saying it, it is not that we don't want to. It is just that it is not an easy thing to do. And then we work on an agreement with the federal VA because uh, we got to get that land, and then we got to get all those things that come with that maintenance of that that cemetery. And they, we pick up that tab in regards to maintenance, and we get some help from the federal VA. So that's what I want to say about that. All right, so to add to that, um, my tribe actually has the land, they have a lot of land, and I just want to share with everybody that I've been on a mission since I've been here to talk to people. Listen can, up! Can I get help on how to develop this Veterans Memorial Cemetery? But you're hearing this side of, we're looking at the land, we're actively doing this, but when I ask, can I get help to develop the cemetery? We have no idea who's in here. I got your card. And your guy said, I have no idea. I want you to talk to this world. So I want everybody to understand the experience that we are having. Don't wait for you. 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 Don't wait for you.
quick question. So we have a very small cemetery in Vancouver that's now taken over by the National Cemetery thing. Yes. How do I get in contact? I want to be buried there. How do I do that? Well, I've been, well, okay. So I've been asking that for years, and the Army had it for years, and I couldn't get anybody to answer a question. So I don't know how many grave sites are on there. Right. We don't reserve grave sites, so... I'll, yeah, I'll find out, because I'm retired, I'm disabled, I'm, you know, so... I'm hoping I qualify, because I was born and raised there. So. Okay, with that... Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah. Passing up too much.